Hello, everybody, and welcome to our second ever virtual shadowing session. We are super excited today to welcome you, um, Dr. Thomas Lisi, who is currently a assistant professor and researcher at the University of Miami. Welcome, Dr. Lisi. Hi, can everyone hear me? Is everyone okay? If there are any technical issues, just um, you know, reach out to the team uh, so that they can address those issues. I know the uh, whole Zoom thing can be uh, tricky sometimes, but um, if there are any issues, just uh, let them know. Um, I'm really excited about this. This is um, um, a great opportunity for me to um, mentor and really try to guide the people into the into fields into um, either you know related to life sciences or the biomedical sciences uh, field. <clears throat> and um, what I'm going to do now is do the uh, share screen, or is it already uh, shared? Uh, I'm not yet sharing. Okay, so how's that? Can you guys see that? Yep, all set. Okay, so, yeah, great. So um, I entitled my talk uh, today, uh, One of Many Ways Toward a Career in, in Life Slash Biomedical Sciences. Okay. And currently I'm an assistant professor in the biology department. And I also have an appointment at the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center. And this is at the medical school. Okay. And um, here is a picture on the side. I'm going to do the annotation as well of a picture of a place that I grew up in. Okay, so I grew up in uh, Japan, in a, right outside of Tokyo, and a place called Nagishi Heights. And this has been very, very influential for me uh, in my career. So the outline for today's uh, presentation is I'm going to go over some of my background. I'm going to put some personal elements into it and then talk about some of my professional uh, career uh, trajectory and some of the things that um, I had accomplished um, in order to get the uh, current position that I'm at uh, right now. And then I'm just going to do kind of a, a brief overview of my research. I think it's a, a bit long. I didn't have really much time to screen it, so I might just uh, uh, kind of go through that really quickly, but there's, there's I don't know, quite a bit of slides. Um, I'll, I'll kind of pick and choose as I go. And then third, I'll provide some slides to guide students. Uh, these are specific slides that might uh, pertain to your situation um, in, in order for you to, um, you know, make those next moves into uh, deciding which, which avenue to, to take down your career path. So what's also important is I put in a couple slides in there talking about uh, some of the things that I do uh, in my lab in, in order for me to uh, reflect and try to uh, be the uh, best PI that I can be for my students and, and give you some kind of hints about what, what you might do if you, you know, one day become a PI yourself, okay? So why am I doing this? Um, basically two reasons. Um, first is to help guide you in your career path, path uh, perhaps in life or biomedical sciences or otherwise. Okay. Um, and the other reason is to help myself become a better principal investigator. It's basically a moment to reflect. So um, I, kind of, I came across this, this uh, quote by uh, Jeff Bezos, that he's the CEO of Amazon. And he said that there are always these serendipity involved in discovery. So this is really interesting coming from the world's most, the richest man in the world, that he would say something like that. So it makes me wonder about where he's coming from. So I kind of look back at his career, you know, starting in this little office, you know, selling books basically off online. And then he's expanded so much over the time that his, his life basically affects every one of our, our lives. And then he's, he says that serendipity is involved in discovery. So that's pretty true. You know, in, in, in research, for example, Aristotle. So Aristotle is the, uh, 
the bother of the scientific method, right? You can, I'm, I'm sure you guys went over that in some of your classes about the principles of the scientific method. But believe it or not, in research, in science, a lot of it has to do with serendipity, okay? That chance occurrence of something that's gonna happen, okay? And it's happened in my career in research. Most of my findings that, I, that I've uncovered this was through serendipity, okay? And then also with your personal life. Serendipity plays a huge impact in your personal life, whether it be in relationships or, you know, anything, something as simple as, um, you know, um, deciding uh, what you're gonna do with your career, for example, or, you know, uh, uh, what, what are you gonna do tomorrow? Okay, what's gonna happen tomorrow? Serendipity plays a big role. So now I'm going to go down to the back, background. So one of the questions that was proposed was to describe my personal definition of my chosen career field. Okay, so chosen I put in brackets because it's kind of, I don't know if I actually chose this or if it was something that was, was part of fate or maybe it was um, something that evolved over time. Okay, but nevertheless, some of the facts that influenced my, my career were, were that in junior high school, when I was living in Japan, I was influenced, interested in becoming a biologist. And it was because of my, 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 my teacher, Mr. Bishop. Okay, so I was living in Japan, I was going to an international school, and uh, he really influenced me in terms of uh, thinking about biology. So I really loved biology, okay. And then I, but I majored in biology in college. Okay, and I'll kind of get into that. I didn't, I didn't get any professional advice on career path in biology or medicine or anything like that. I had no internships and I did apply a couple places. Uh, one of which was in Mountain View, California. I had no idea where Mountain View was, but I applied, never heard back from them. I felt lost when I, I graduated. Okay, completely lost. But I had a degree, I had a degree in biology. And then soon after graduation, I moved out to California uh, because I, I knew at the time, so this is in the uh, mid to late nineties, I knew that Silicon Valley was the place to be if you had a biology or a, a science degree. So I decided to go out to California, not just for that reason, but actually to look for my grandfather. So I, I, I didn't know much about my grandfather, only that he lived out somewhere in the East Bay, and this was in uh, San Pablo. So I went out there and I actually, um, you know, developed a really good relationship with him during that period. And after that, I found my first job at UCSF. Okay, so this was as a staff research associate. And what happened was I stayed there for three years you know, those, those were huge influential years of my life, okay? But that was three years, that was a, a long time, okay? So for three years, you know, I was in my early 20s, you know, three years, I was, I was kind of getting tired of that. And then I had contemplated uh, several jobs in industry. And actually I did get a couple offers and I was pretty excited about that, but, um, I ended up deciding to pursue a career in biomedical sciences in uh, uh, academia. And I'll kind of get into that reason in the next slide, why I decided to stick in academia. And then thereafter, I, I continued uh, till today in academia down this path, which basically entails research, teaching, and administrative duties, okay? So I do a lot of research, I do a lot of teaching, and also deal with the administrative duties, okay? So right now my path was basically, I got a master's of science degree. I then got my PhD degree. And then I did two postdocs, okay? So these are postdoctoral research uh, training uh, two times. And then I became a core director of a research genomics research facility, okay? And then after that, I went into industry into uh, this company called the Jackson Lab. 
Okay, I'll kind of talk about that later. Then finally, I ended up uh, back in academia as an assistant professor, for which I am content, and I'm pretty, pretty happy about that. So in terms of the education train, uh, this is taken from my uh, bio sketch. Okay, so when you, when you get into, you know, academia, you, you're, you have to provide what's called a bio sketch. And this is a sketch that basically outlines your, your education and training okay, over the course of the years. Okay, so you can see here, um, I started off my undergrad in Purdue University. Okay, and then after that, I focused on neurobiology. Uh, slash uh, physiology, okay? And after that, I went to Germany, okay? I did my master's, okay? But I had a gap year, okay? And I'll talk about my gap year down here, okay? Then I went and did my PhD, then I did my two postdocs, okay? So that transition from undergrad uh, to, to this sort of post-bachelorette experience as a, a staff research associate, was the greatest, it was the foot in the door. Okay, it was my foot in the door. Okay, so basically this transition going from undergrad at Purdue, which I felt completely lost. I had a bachelor's of science degree, but I had no training, no experience. Getting this position was that foot in the door. Okay, and we can talk about this later, how I actually got this position. But once I got that position, I was extremely happy. I was there for three years. And what made this experience so, so great was all the people in that lab. Okay, so I worked with uh, Dr. Stephen DeArmond. Okay, so he was very influential in this whole process. And not only did he talk about science, but he talked about a lot of other things. So what he, what I learned from him was that it was more about science, more than science. It was other things in life. So he really cared about, you know, ice skating. So he had this hobby of doing ice skating. So he would, you know, come into the lab and always talk about that. And that made a really great environment, learning environment, and training environment. But as I said, it was three years. You know, this is something you guys are going to experience as well. You know, when you're so young in your, your careers, you know, three years goes, it's a long time. So I had this big question, you know, I, what am I going to do next? You know, I'm not in school. I'm um, uh, part of staff, research uh, staff. Um, what am I going to do next? And I was still, I was still learning during this time. I was actually auditing um, Dr. Steve DeArmond's courses. He was teaching a number of uh, medical school courses in pathology. So I was sitting in and and taking notes and, and uh, auditing his classes. So I always had that interest in, in a staying in academia. But I, I was, I, was uh, I, I needed the next, next thing in my life. So what I did was I decided to go back to school to obtain you know, a doctoral degree. And this time it was in Germany, okay? So you're probably asking why, why Germany, okay? So this is a, this is another um, sort of uh, quote that I, that kind of sums it up. Okay, so this is Groucho Marx. So he's a famous uh, American comedian. So what he said what, was that man does not control his own fate. The women in his life do that for him. <laughs> so actually my, my wife is actually German. So at that time we were living in San Francisco. She was working in industry uh, out in, uh, Fremont, and she needed, she wanted to go back to Germany and get her degree, okay? So that was perfect. I, I decided, even though I had a couple, I had a couple offers to go back, go to industry, I decided to go with my wife, follow my wife to Germany, and my mind was set for the next six years to pursue my, uh, my uh, PhD. So what I did was I started uh, in a master's program in the University of Stuttgart, and um, then I transitioned over to um, Munich. So that's about, uh, you know, two hours drive away from, from, uh, uh, from Stuttgart, okay? So when I was in uh, Stuttgart, I did my master's uh, thesis, which was titled uh, Neuroprotective Roles of TNF Receptor 2 uh, 
uh, against glutamate toxicity. Okay, so I worked with uh, Professor Klaus Spitzemeyer. He's no longer there anymore. He's retired, but um, I really appreciated his uh, consideration. So he basically took me in to his lab, uh, knowing that um, you know I'm a, I was a foreigner. I was an American, um, you know, wanting to go in, in, into a German research institution, uh, academic research institution. So he actually took me under his wing and he taught me um, and his group uh, everything there needs to know to be known about TNF. So we know a lot about TNF, right? So that's the uh, pro-inflammatory cytokine, right? So he was developing all these antibodies, these neutralizing antibodies, these antagonist agonists. And I had used those, a lot, all of his antibodies to look at how if you had triggered one of the TNF receptors, the receptor two, how it protects against um, toxicity, okay? So glutamate induced toxicity. And I was using these primary uh, cortical neurons uh, that I was uh, separating from mouse brains. So all of those techniques I had learned back at UCSF. So it was really great to make that transition into his lab and to become really independent into um, and to uh, fulfilling some of his uh, interests and also uh, fulfilling some of my interests in um, neurodegenerative diseases, essentially. And the other thing that you have to take into mind is when I was, back then, I, I was thinking about things in a very linear way. Okay, what I mean by that is that I was working as a postdoc in a neurodegenerative laboratory, neuropathology laboratory. And I also did my bachelor's degree in neurobiology. I was always thinking kind of that tunnel vision, neurons, neuroscience, neurobiology. Fortunately, so what happened was when I did my PhD, I changed fields, okay? So I started to um, get into functional genomics, okay? And this has a lot to do with funding, okay? And this is something that you'll uh, realize as you, as you uh, go through life um, that the funding, where the money comes uh, from, really dictates uh, to a large degree what kind of work that you do and how that influences your career trajectory, okay? So as I, as I mentioned, after Stuttgart, I went to Munich, okay? So that's about two hours drive away, and I started doing my PhD. Okay, and I was modeling human diseases in mice, okay? And the types of human diseases were related to musculoskeletal diseases, okay? And that was something that my uh, PhD father, or my um, advisor, uh, they call the you know, PhD advisors uh, fathers in Germany, uh, he was interested in, okay? So he needed a PhD student to, um, uh, develop these mouse models, okay? And so I uh, worked there, had a great time, and what we were doing was using this method called um, uh, ENU mutagenesis, okay? So I was working alongside this company that he started, so he basically generated a whole library of mutations in mouse sperm, okay? So these sperm were uh, randomly mutagenized, okay? And then what we were doing was we're phenotyping thousands and thousands of mice, okay? And we were doing these at high throughput level, okay? And it's a very, very uh, uh, interesting and very, very uh, uh, complicated process, but you need a lot of support, okay? So the whole complex is uh, here. It's part of the German mouse clinic. So we basically uh, looked at all those mice, mutagenized mice in the mouse clinic for relevant phenotypes, okay? These different disorders. And then from that, I was interested in the musculoskeletal disorders, okay? And then uh, we also found a number of other uh, disorders. And the cool thing about living here and being part of this uh, community was that it's right across the street from the Allianz Arena. I don't know if we have any uh, uh, championships league uh, uh, fans out there, but that's uh, where the FC Bayern play. 
So these are, they're one of the best um, uh, soccer teams in the world. So literally it's the, the stadium is like right over here on the side. And uh, we used to go uh, uh, walking and you know, jogging past, past the uh, arena all the time. So um, one of the things that's very important is to obtain a research fellowship. Okay, so if you're thinking about going into research uh, in academia, uh, you know, graduate school, for example, you, you should, it's, it's highly recommended that you apply for these uh, research fellowships. Okay, so the one that I got was from the, uh, from the uh, European um, uh, Commission or the European Union, okay? So it was a, um, a fellowship looking at the molecular mechanisms of bone formation and anabolism. And so what we had done proposed was that we were going to use that, that screen that I talked to you about, that huge mutagenesis screen uh, to look at novel factors or molecular regulators of uh, bone formation and anabolism or growth. Okay, So I got that fellowship and it was four years of paid research in education. Okay, Otherwise, what I would have had to do is scramble and look for the money to help pay for my research. Okay, and that would have entailed doing a lot of teaching. And when you teach, it's great as well if you want to go down that trajectory. But if you want to stick in research, you have to get the, the, the money, basically. But one of the uh, things I had to accept was I had to change my chosen field of neurobiology and neuroscience. So I got into a completely different field, which I don't regret at all. It was a, it was a great learning experience because a lot of the uh, things that I learned during that experience, I transition even to my students that I have today. And then just uh, as an aside, just to show the impact that that research group has on general society is looking at this paper. This paper came out in 2016. And this is going through that same pipeline that I talked about, the mutagenesis, and then also looking at the uh, phenotypes. They also had this uh, uh, pipeline there looking at epigenetics. Okay, so these are factors, environmental factors that affect um, how genes are expressed, for example. So I think you guys heard about diabetes and obesity. And what they had shown for the first time was from that group that I did my PhD in was that depending on whether or not your parents are obese or not, that can be transferred down to the offspring. Okay, so that was a huge, huge finding. Okay, so the findings suggest that parental high fat diet can additively render offspring more obese. Okay, and it's basically the same uh, effect if it's if it, if your mother or your father is obese. Okay. So how they did that was through that, uh, what's called IVF, in vitro fertilization. Okay, so as I, as I mentioned, we were a huge, huge uh, mouse uh, group, okay, a reproductive group as well. And we were able to take uh, either sperm or oocytes or eggs from obese or lean fathers or mothers, and then um, do the in vitro fertilization, and then look, phenotype all those animals that came that were derived from those different combinations and came to the strong conclusion that indeed, you know, the uh, sperm coming from those obese fathers led to offspring that were in fact more obese than the controls. Okay, so this is a huge, huge um, uh, finding um, that was uh, part of, you know, my, my um, uh, PhD group. And we've done uh, tons of those types of experiments. Um, sorry, Dr. Lee. There's a Lucy. There's a question. Why do we use mice as a model organism for this type of research? Yeah. So, and that's a great question. That's a great question. Um, we generally use in research animal models. You know, if it be uh, mice, it could be pigs, it could be Drosophila, it could be C. elegans, which are little worms. Uh, for a number of reasons, okay. Um, 
the mice, they have a physiological system that's and a genetic system that is not entirely conserved, but it's uh, conserved to a certain extent. There are some similarities between uh, mice and humans. And we do this because we cannot perform experiments in humans. Just, that's just unethical. So one of the, uh, we have to find a surrogate, right? So we use model organisms. And I have to preface the fact that not every model organism is perfect. For example, mice. Mice are nocturnal. They have a different sleep awake activity. Okay, so basically at night they're more active. During the day they're sleeping. We aren't like that. We we are we, we're the opposite. Okay, so if you're if you're looking at hormones, for example, or stress factors, you got to consider uh, you know, those issues. Um, and you also logistically you got to think about how are you going to do those experiments? When are you going to measure those hormones, those steroids? Are you going to be measuring them during their active state versus their uh, resting state in order to correlate that with, you know, human physiology? You know, those are things that, um, you know, even people that work in these, on these model organisms, model organisms, uh, some people don't really take those seriously. But um, that was a good question. There's a, there's a lot of other nuances to that, uh, depending on you know, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, biology that you're interested in. For example, wound healing. You know, uh, wound healing I, I'm working on right now, um, the best model organism for wound healing are, believe it or not, pigs. Uh, pigs have a, a skin physiology that's more um, similar to that of humans with respect to uh, sweat gland and hair follicle combinations. Uh, as opposed to the mice. But I have to use mice because they're a lot cheaper compared to the pigs. The pigs could be around uh, $4,000 per pig. But anyways, um, those are, they're, it's a really good question. So, so after I did my um, uh, PhD, I was recruited to the NIH uh, here. So this was really interesting because I had published a paper as a PhD student in Germany, and then I got an email from one of the chiefs at the National Institutes of Ch uh, Child and Human Development. Okay, so it's at one of the institutes at the NIH. And she had asked me through the email, what are my plans after um, my uh, PhD? And I said, I didn't, I didn't really, I wasn't thinking about it because I was so, so concentrated on the research. I was really, really excited. As a graduate student, my, my mind was just 100% research. And I didn't think about it. So she had flown me out from Germany to the NIH and I gave a talk over there about all these mouse models that I had developed uh, one of them was a model for osteogenesis imperfecta, so that's the glass bone disease. And she was the uh, head of that department, the glass, the osteogenesis imperfecta uh, center. And they, she offered me uh, an intramural NIH fellowship. And I had taken it for a year. However, after that year, I wanted to um, be with my wife. Okay, so that's the, the honest truth. Okay, my wife was started, had started a postdoctoral research fellowship at UCLA, and I was at the NIH. I remember that quote from, from Groucho Marx, you know, so basically I, I, I quit my position, my fellowship at the NIH, and I followed my wife to UCLA, where I started my officially my first postdoc uh, position there because I was I still had not received my PhD degree I was kind of in the wing so to speak on this intramural fellowship okay so there was some some a bit of gap but then I started at UCLA and I stayed there for about three years at UCLA 
And I was with this group here. So this is led by Martin Hewison and John Adams. And this is at the Orthopedic uh, Hospital Research Center, part of UCLA. Okay. And I was doing a lot of work on bone. I was, I was staying in my field. Okay. But this time I was doing stuff related to vitamin D. So these uh, two PIs here are uh, big players in the vitamin D field. Okay. So there's me. And then there's Justine. Okay, Justine is from Paris, okay? So she and I developed a very good working relationship, okay? So she was the MD and I was the PhD, okay? So this is very important, okay? This PhD MD relationship because she came up with ideas that were completely different from my ideas, okay? My ideas were completely different from hers. But together, we actually published a beautiful paper looking at uh, the role of vitamin D in iron um, transport, okay, through this uh, channel called hypsidin, okay. So this is a huge, huge paper in the field. So this is in um, nephrology, okay, so kidney um, uh, research, okay. So this is looking at these patients, these chronic kidney disease patients that have this vitamin def deficiency. And so she came at, came from this, came at this angle from a MD perspective. So she was looking at all these patients, these CKD patients, and I was in the lab doing all the gene expression. And I was in this part here to promote a reporter in chromatin immunoprecipitation analysis. So I was basically the PhD in this, uh, relationship. I was doing all the uh, 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 gene expression analysis, which contributed to this entire body of work. Okay. So as you guys progress in your careers, you know, whether it be a, as an MD or a PhD or an MD PhD, what works is this relationship. Okay. Um, that's very, very, very important, uh, especially in academia. Okay. In academia, um, you have to have this relationship, whether it being your grant writing or um, in terms of getting things published, you have to have this relationship. Maybe in private, it doesn't have to be so, but in academia, this relationship is very, very important. And then after that, I did my postdoc, and then I kind of um, um, had some, some kind of personal issues. Um, and the truth is, I was working in, uh, at, in Boston and Harvard at the time as during my second postdoc. And then my wife was up in Maine. She had her uh, uh, faculty position, okay? And remember that quote from Groucho Marx, <laughs> you know, I basically followed my wife over time, okay? So I was, I was completing my uh, second postdoc in, in, in Harvard, and then I, I could not do the traveling anymore. That's the reality. I just could not travel, um, you know, 12 hours from Boston to, to Maine uh, for two years. And I was doing that for two years. And I also had a, a child, okay? So what I did was I eventually found a position at a place called the Jackson Lab. Okay, so this is the, uh, up in Maine, uh, it's a beautiful place. Okay, it's a beautiful place in, in Acadia National Parks. If you haven't been there, please go out there. It's a beautiful place. And basically, it's an it's a independent private biomedical research institution and commercial enterprise. If you work with animals, mice in your research, and as you go through the labs, grad school, uh, PhD, or, or so forth, even MDs work with, uh, with mice, okay? Um, you the chances are high that you probably get those mice from the Jackson lab, okay? So I was there as a staff scientist. I was working on a lot of reproductive biology things, and I was actually moonlighting in the evenings, okay? So I was working with one of the uh, PIs on his interests. He was working on uh, looking at epigenetics and IVF, as I mentioned, and I was, uh, I was doing similar things uh, in that nature. But what I was doing was, uh, that was nine to five. And I would come home, I would take 
my, my son, uh, take care of him. And then in the evenings, when he gets, goes to bed around nine o'clock, I would drive back to the lab, you know, nine, 10 o'clock in the evenings. And I was working on my interests that were, that I was doing back in, back at Harvard. That is wound healing and skin. Okay, so I was actually um, on the side generating data to one day support a lot of the work that I'm doing right now. Okay, so that's how I figured out how to survive. Okay, so now we get into my research right now. So right now, I mean, you can go down, go to the web, type in lucylab.org, you can come to my website. So essentially, I'm studying skin and cancer biology here at the University of Miami. And the first thing that I write here is understanding molecular and cellular biology for research and teaching. So basically, I use skin, all the cells in the skin, uh, to understand a lot of the molecular and cellular uh, events that occur and some of the uh, uh, kind of the physiological events that occur in the skin. Okay. And then I transition a lot of that to cancer, okay? because a lot of the factors, these uh, growth factors that are playing a role in the skin and the hormones directly influence cancer. And in particular, I uh, look at bone cancer. Okay? And this is all in vitro, so it's not uh, too much of a um, kind of a digression from, from the skin. Okay? So it's, I, have a, I have a little a cell culture lab uh, in my in my lab that I can um, uh, conduct these types of experiments. So basically, as I mentioned, I look at skin wound repair and hair formation. So these are hair follicles, and I look at the basic biology, basically, and the mechanism of action of these two compounds, the vitamin D, and also this uh, neurotrophic factor called GDNF. So that's the glia-derived neurotrophic factor. Okay. And just keep in mind, these two factors, I'm interested in these two factors because of serendipity. Okay, so we talked about that Jeff Bezos uh, quote, serendipity. Okay, so I did not go in thinking that I would uh, start my research lab uh, focusing on GDNF. I got interested in GDNF because it was a serendipitous finding. Okay, and this is something that you guys, if you stick in research, uh, will encounter, and you have to utilize that, okay, that knowledge, that new knowledge that you've uh, uncovered, and apply it to uh, uh, your own research and trying to take it forward, okay. So I, my work actually encompasses uh, many of the uh, 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 a different disciplines. So it's a multidisciplinary approach. So I look a little bit of uh, developmental biology. I look a little bit of cell biology, molecular biology, tissue engineering, regeneration, stem cell biology, bioinformatics, and genetics. Okay, so I incorporate all of these different disciplines into studying the skin and cancer biology. Okay. Um, so right now, yeah. I have a quick question. Sorry. Sure. When you talk about developmental biology in your research, what do you specifically pertain to? Yeah, I can get into that. Um, yeah, that's a good question. It's a very good question. Um, so if you kind of go back here, so these hair follicles, that's a mature hair follicle. So you've got to think about how does those mature hair follicles exist, right? So you go from development, from basically starting from scratch. Okay, so how does that hair follicle um, become a hair follicle, okay? How does it evolve into this structure from beginning? And from beginning generally means from um, the embryo, okay? Starting from um, embryonic stages, okay? So I have a couple projects looking at how um, this hair follicle is formed involving this factor, okay? So this factor has, is very complicated, okay? So it entails a lot of receptors. It entails a lot of interactions. So you gotta think about it in a spatial temporal manner, okay? 
Okay, so spatially, meaning where is this vector being expressed or present? And temporal, meaning at what time, okay, during development. So I have a couple projects where we use what's called a reporter assay. Okay, so we can look for where this factor is activating its cells. Okay, so it's a, it's a ligand, the receptor interaction. So the ligand is this growth factor, and the receptors are expressed on specific cells. Okay, and those are the target cells. So I use that reporter assay over time during development to understand which cells are being affected or most likely being affected by this factor. And I also incorporate other elements, for example, um, genetics. So we can knock out those receptors and those specific cell types to functionally assess whether or not that growth factor and its receptors play a role during the development of the hair follicle. So, um, I mean, that's a good question. It's a very are good you question. Using, are you using pig embryos or is this mice or is it in vitro? I'm doing everything uh, for this part, the development, um, this growth factor, I'm doing everything with mice. I'm also doing, um, I, I can purify these stem cells uh, using what's called fax. So this is uh, fluorescent activated cell sorting. So we can um, sort out and purify the stem cells and culture them in vitro. And then we can activate, add different concentrations of uh, GDNF and then look at those, um, the response, the activation of those stem cells. So we've, uh, we've done a lot of those experiments and also, um, what's important is that we're doing a lot of screens. We have a couple of small molecule compounds. So these are synthetic compounds that are um, predicted to activate this pathway. And we're testing those compounds in both the in, in vivo, so in the intact hair follicles. And we're also looking at whether or not, whether or not those synthetic compounds can activate the stem cells when we take them out of the uh, organism and culture them in vitro into plates, okay? So we have, uh, actually, I'm working on a patent right now um, with the patent office here at UM. Um, I'm looking at one of these compounds. And I, unfortunately, I didn't put any of that in the, in the research part of it today. But if you guys are interested, just uh, my email, everything is going to be posted on at the end of the at the end of the seminar, um, you guys can reach out and let and ask me questions about those those types of things. That is really interesting. Thank you so much for answering. Yeah, no problem. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah, so research in general, you know, if you want to think about developing your own research program, you have to um, first of all you got to develop your areas of research. You know, you got to be knowledgeable. And you got to know your field. Okay. And what's also very important is you have to ask questions. Always ask questions. Okay. And then that's going to lead to credibility. Okay. Whether or not your research program is credible or not. Okay. And then you're going to have to develop expertise. Okay. So my general personal bias is that in order to develop a research program, you have to um, attack both common and less common conditions okay, or situations. Okay? And what I mean by that is that if you kind of hold yourself up looking at a specific, let's say, orphan disease okay, or a boutique disease, um, there's a chance that you might not get funding for, for that because of the uh, limited exposure, so to speak. So my approach is to look at both, okay, into something more common and less common. And in my research, I, the, the more common is diabetes, okay, so I have a couple projects looking at diabetes, okay. As I mentioned, my, my previous group were experts in diabetes, so I, I'm um, collaborating with them, also doing my own stuff here with diabetes. 
Okay, it's, but what's important is that your research contributes to the knowledge base. Okay, and also what's important is to be available. You know, I'm kind of talking from, you know, a PI's perspective. So I have to be available for students, collaborators, staff, all hands on deck. Okay, so whenever there's a there's a problem or there's some questions or there, whether there there's some interesting papers they bring up, I have to be available. Okay, and then importantly, I have you have to enjoy who you are working with. Okay, so right now I have uh, three members in my lab. I got Nada, I got Karen, and I got C. Okay, so. Uh, she's my RA, and she's my undergraduate student, and then uh, Neda is my uh, uh, graduate student. And, and we've actually, Neda and I have published uh, this year, 2020, uh, two pretty good papers we got in Nature Regenerative Medicine, uh, the story about GDMF, and I'll kind of talk about that later. And then we got one in Frontiers in Cell Development Biology, where we were looking at the role of microRNA. So I don't know if you guys have taken any uh, cell biology courses, gone over what microRNAs are, but we decided to look at uh, what microRNAs were doing in these hair follicle stem cells okay, during hair development. Uh, that was kind of mentioned by the, one of the students. So there you go. Feel free to look at these papers. They're pretty interesting. So uh, this is just a snapshot of what um, some of the things that we're doing. Uh, so we're looking at uh, stem cell dynamics and migration and plasticity during wound healing and hair development. Okay. So this is uh, basically a scheme of your skin. This is during rest or homeostasis. So you got these hair follicles and you got the uh, different cell types listed here in the skin. So this is basically uh, at rest. Okay. But when you uh, encounter an injury, um, as shown here, you know, there's going to be uh, uh, clotting and then you're going to have an inflammatory response. And then there's a number of events happening, a number of cell types being activated. And then over time, you're going to have the, uh, the lost tissue. Remember, this is an entire area that's been lost, uh, basically um, form again. Okay, so you're going to have this huge proliferation of cells, okay, to basically fill in that wound, okay? And then over time, you're gonna have remodeling of that wound, okay, of that, of that area that was filled in. And what that means is you're gonna have new collagen deposition, you're gonna have new um, um, cell types come in, it's a whole remodeling. And the whole goal of this process is to try to get back to that normal situation, normal condition, okay? But nine times, nine times out of 10, your skin will not remodel back to the normal condition. Okay, this is just a known fact, especially as you age. As you age, your skin will not remodel back to its normal condition. So this is a major dilemma in the field of regenerative medicine and regenerative biology. How do you get back to the normal condition? So one of the things that people have been noticing is that under certain conditions, okay, wounding conditions, you can actually stimulate the regeneration of hair follicles. Okay? So these are called neogenic hair follicles after wounding. Okay, so wound-induced hair follicle neogenesis. Okay. So what another consequence of these having these hair follicles is that it remodels the entire extracellular environment back to the normal condition. Okay, so if you can somehow promote this new hair follicle formation or regeneration, you also have the consequences of uh, improving the scar, scarring. Okay, so it basically has an antifibrotic effect. So that's the importance of having these hair follicles. Okay. So that's kind of, if you look at the GDNF paper that we recently published, that's kind of what we're getting at, getting at with our uh, GDNF. So GDNF. Uh, the glial cell derived neurotrophic factor that I mentioned is basically promoting this, um, this effect. And what we're trying to do is figure out how does it promote the, uh, these neogenic hair follicles? What are, what are the mechanisms? So in terms of the, uh, how are we doing on time? Um, we're doing good, we're doing good. 
Okay, because, uh, okay, so some, some of the basic background about what I do is I, I also look at uh, the stem cells of the hair, hair follicle. Okay, I, I want to really emphasize the importance of these uh, stem cells. So basically, in general, stem cells have uh, certain, certain um, how do you say, functions, okay, certain uh, given functions. One of them is to self-renew, okay, so basically to give rise to its, its clone, okay. Otherwise, it's no longer a stem cell. Okay. And the other uh, property of stem cells is to be able to go down different lineages, okay, uh, to basically change their cell identity depending on the different cues that exist in the environment. Okay. So for the bulge stem cells that's lo localized here in this compartment, the bulge compartment, those stem cells can give rise to sebocytes. So sebocytes are basically um, oil gland cells or sebaceous gland cells that are part of the uh, hair follicle. Or the stem cells could give rise to epidermal keratinocytes. So these are the cells that exist in the epidermal layer. Okay. Okay. So depending on the signals in the environment, they have three different paths in the images, either up to the epidermis to the sebaceous gland, or they can become part of the hair follicles themselves. So that's going down the hair lineage, hair follicle lineage, okay? So under homeostasis, this is by default, okay? Oops, sorry. By default during homeostasis, these stem cells give rise to its own kind, okay? They go down the hair follicle lineage. And there's a lot of regulatory factors, these niche factors, we call them, that balance the activation of these stem cells. So if you have a perfect balance, you're gonna keep these stem cells in a state of quiescence. They're resting. So basically they're not proliferating, they're not, they're not uh, self-renewing, nor are they going down the different lineages, okay? So this is called quiescence. So, but when you have an injury, when you have an injury, you're going to change that microenvironment, that skin microenvironment. And one of the consequences of wounding is the influence that it has on those stem cells and their change in identity, cell identity. Okay, so this was back in 2005, where if you can label those stem cells, those hair follicle stem cells, those bulge stem cells, and then you induce a wound, okay, so induce a wound. So these are these blue cells, those stem cells. And then over time, as the wound is healing, it's also shown here, as the wound is healing, you have these tracts of cells that basically be part of the epidermis, that neo-epidermis, that healed wound, okay? So that tells you that those stem cells, after wounding, is somehow being triggered into becoming epidermal cells, okay? And what they're doing up there is they're basically repairing that environment, that damaged environment, okay? And this is a transient effect. Over time, when they heal, when you have a complete healing process, those blue cells die off, okay? So for, in, in one sense, they're, they're acting transiently. They're going to that region, and they're doing a reparative function, okay? Inducing a re reparative function and then they die off, okay? So that's also shown here. So you get the bulge stem cells um, that uh, their progeny differentiate into becoming uh, part of the uh, wound neoepidermis and they help in the uh, repair process. And then in 2012, uh, the um, investigators out of the uh, Fuchs lab in, uh, in Rochester, or Rockefeller in uh, New York City actually show the same thing happens with these sweat glands, okay? These, uh, so you got cells, stem cells in these sweat glands that have that same potential. That is, after injury, having, uh, having the progenitors, the derivatives from the stem cells from the different compartments of these sweat glands help um, repair that damaged tissue, okay? So depending on the type of skin, 
Remember these sweat glands, if you think about yourself, you've got more sweat glands on the palms of your hand and less hair follicles. You're activating if you have a cut or a wound, different types of stem cells, depending on the depth of that wound and location and the type of uh, skin that you have, okay? So in terms of uh, hair development, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm interested in hair development and morph morphogenesis. So this is going back to that question from, from the, uh, from the uh, student about the uh, development. So as I mentioned, you have um, you know, early development of, uh, of the skin and that the skin is actually derived from the ectoderm. Um, so the epidermis, the upper layers from the ectoderm and then the lower uh, portion is part of the dermis that's uh, derived from the mesoderm. Okay, so as you're going uh, through morphogenesis to develop a hair follicle, you have a number of signals. Okay, so these signals can emanate from the dermis. Okay, so that's, that's the first dermal signal and it's Wnt. Okay, so Wnt is a major morphogen and that plays a role in both development and uh, adult life. Okay, so you got the first signal called Wnt. And what that does is that it triggers these epidermal cells that are uh, overlying the dermis into uh, formation of a structure called the plaque coat. Okay, so this plaque coat sign of early development, early formation of a hair follicle. Okay, so it's a precursor of the hair follicle. Okay, so you got a lot of proliferation and then over time you have what's called a first signal that comes from the from the plaque coat that signals down to the dermis. Okay, to form these uh, dermal condensates. Okay, so these are specific cells in the dermis that interact with the epidermis. So there's a very close uh, relationship. It's called the epidermal mesenchymal uh, interaction or relationship. Okay, and that triggers the uh, uh, ensuing events. Uh, for example, the uh, increased proliferation of the epidermal cells to eventually form this downward ingrowth. Okay, over time, with the uh, uh, those dermal condensates over time differentiate and become the dermal papilla. Okay, and then eventually over time, by day 14 in mice, you have the formation of the first hair follicle. Okay, so this is the first mature hair follicle by day 14 that emanates from development. Okay, and the dermal papilla is very important because it houses number of cells that secrete growth factors. And it basically communicates with the stem cells, okay, with the stem cells to regulate those stem cells in either a quiescent or an activation state, okay. And what I'm interested in is looking at GDNF during the very early development, formation of these plaque coats and the morphogenesis, okay. So what we found was that GDNF is actually one of the first epidermal signals that relays down to the dermis, in okay, fact, that, that generates these dermal condensates. And how we did that was by looking at the receptors for GDNF and looking at GDNF itself. GDNF being localized here, so that's the, uh, the uh, ligand, and all its receptors are down here. Okay? And over time, you have formation of dermal condensates. And this is a very important concept to understand that GDNF is functioning during hair follicle development. What about adult life? What about in adults that get injured? Is GDNF, does GDNF have the ability to form those gene, uh, neogenic hair follicles by reestablishing a more developmental like environment in that wounded skin? So that's the central question that I have, my lab has, in terms of this GDNF project that we have going on right now. So role of GDN signaling during hair follicle and skin development and during uh, neogenic hair follicle formation in adults. So um, you know, what, I, what we kind of went over was the uh, morphogenic period, right? So that's the establishment of the first hair follicle. Okay, so that's the first hair follicle that is derived from um, embryonic development, okay? However, during the adult um, uh, stage, in the adults, their hair follicles go through what's called the hair cycle. 
And it's important to understand that the hair cycle, although it's cycling, it is part of the normal homeostasis or the homeostatic process within the skin. So the hair follicles themselves are considered uh, mini organs of the skin, okay? Although they're cycling, going from a growth stage to a resting telogen stage with an intermediate catagen stage or a regression stage, it is part of the normal homeostasis process of skin, okay? So you have the growth phase, uh, uh, phase and then you got catagen. So remember, I, I mentioned the importance of that dermal papilla. Okay, so these are derived from the uh, mesenchyme. During catagen regression, all these differentiated cells of the hair follicle will die through what's called programmed cell death or apoptosis. And by death, okay, during that cycle, it brings that dermal papilla in close, close proximity to the bulge stem cell compartment that's shown up here. So during rest, there's a there's an intimate relationship based on proximity between the uh, dermal papilla and the stem cell compartment. Okay, remember the stem this dermal papilla is, is uh, regulating the activity of that uh, stem cell compartment. Okay, and then when you have activation of the new the next cycle the growth stage. These dermal papillas secrete WINT, that morphogen we talked about. Very similar to that as, during development, right? During the early development, you've got WINT being secreted. And because of its close proximity, it's going to activate those stem cells that are part of that epithelium, okay? Part of that epithelium. And then you're going to have sonic hedgehog. That's another morphogen that's important for the proliferation of those um, uh, differentiated or of those uh, progeny, progenitor cells from the uh, stem cells, and to becoming a new uh, fully mature hair follicle. And then the cycle continues. And unfortunately, as we age and under uh, certain conditions, uh, many of us encounter uh, hair loss. Okay? So this is, uh, for the most part, and generally it's because of this stage, right here, this regression, there's accelerated catagen. So a lot of the uh, people that have hair loss is due to the fact that uh, they have hairs that are going through this accelerated catagen uh, stage and then uh, kept in this uh, telogen stage as well. So in terms of my research, we're looking at vitamin D and GDNF and how uh, we can try to stimulate this whole uh, response. And we kind of look at this from a number of perspectives. So what's interesting is that both the vitamin D receptor and the GDNF receptor uh, genetic lock, knockouts uh, have uh, loss uh, of this postmorphogenic hair cycling. So basically, their hair is. And that's kind of shown here. So the vitamin D, so you got the knockout of the vitamin D receptor. So if you look at the skin, we've done a lot of studies with this. Um, it has no hair. And um, it's because of the uh, defect in the post-morphogenic cycle. So these animals with that vitamin D have normal morphogenesis of hair follicles. So that means during the embryonic development and the formation of the first hair follicle, there's not absolutely nothing wrong. Um, it's, it's until you get to the cycling stage that the vitamin D receptor or vitamin D itself is very important uh, in the regulation of the hair, hair follicles. And one of the consequences is uh, the, in the vitamin D knockout animals, you have these huge cysts. Okay, so these are uh, what, what we call dermal uh, lipid laden cysts. Okay, so these are all filled with these uh, oil pockets. Okay, so these are uh, huge sebocytes, these sebaceous ones, okay, with these cysts. Okay, so what we're also trying to do is to figure out. What is causing all these cysts? What is the uh, cellular and molecular uh, mechanisms that are causing all these cysts in these knockout mice? And we think it has something to do with the uh, control over the fate of those stem cells, those hair follicle stem cells, so that the vitamin D receptor is somehow regulating, controlling the fate of those stem cells 
So basically, if you have those receptors, you're promoting the, uh, the fate, the correct fate of those uh, stem cells. And how we answer that question is by doing what we call lineage tracing experiments. So basically what you do is you mark those stem cells and then over time, you look at the whereabouts of those descendants of that initially marked stem cells. So if we, if we compare the vitamin D receptor knockout versus the wild type, over time we would expect those cells to be localized to those um, uh, dermal or these uh, sebaceous compartments. And in fact, that's what we see. So I, I don't provide any of that um, data. But um, another way of looking at this is um, looking at what we call chip seek experiments. So this is called um, uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation. Okay, so basically, you want to look at where the vitamin E receptor is binding to. Okay, what targets are the vitamin E receptor binding to? So this is looking at a one-to-one -one relationship. So these are this types these types of experiments are basically uh, directly looking at the cause and effect. Okay, because a lot of these uh, findings you'll 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 realize as you progress in your careers, and it's a very big challenge for a lot of the clinicians and even uh, basic researchers is to understand what are the direct and indirect relationships. So this method actually looks at the direct uh, targets of the vitamin D receptor. And that's asking, um, what does the vitamin D receptor interact with? Okay, so this is, remember the vitamin D receptor is a nuclear receptor, so it's binding to promoter regions and target genes. So you basically pull down uh, whatever the vitamin D receptor is binding to, and you do whole uh, sequencing of those um, targets, and then you can identify uh, those specific targets. And what we had done was we overlaid that, that set of genes, those target genes, with changes, known actual changes in RNA. Okay? So we were trying to increase the specificity of our targets by correlating it with the uh, changes in the uh, RNA, the actual RNA level, okay? And then we came up with this, uh, a number of uh, target genes. So we were looking at Wnt target genes, uh, for example, axon 2 and then hedgehog target genes, like we one okay? And then I also, we also found a lot of migration genes. And then there was one stem cell gene, which we're focusing on right now as the uh, master gene that helps in the, uh, uh, det determining the actual fate of those stem cells. Okay, so these, a lot of this work has already been published. So a number of questions uh, that we have is, uh, what does vitamin D signal do in the hair follicle stem cells? So we know um, in the absence of the vitamin D receptor, is there defects in hair stem cell self-renewal, quiescence, commitment, precursor migration? And then in terms of therapy, what's interesting is, um, remember I showed you that those animals, those vitamin D receptor knockouts, don't have, they have alopecia, right? So they have hair loss. So the question is, what can you do about that? How, how would you go about um, trying to rescue, trying to promote hair growth in those animals? Okay. So what signaling factors can interact or bypass vitamin D in stem cells? Okay. So one of the one of the uh, uh, ingredients to this is this GDNF. So what we found was that if you take GDNF and then you activate those stem cells in those vitamin D receptor knockout mice, it actually grows hair. It actually does even more than that. It changes those cysts that I talked about, all those cysts. There's actually lots of those cysts. So if we sell this GDNF, what we're, what we're finding out is that it's an actual it's going parallel to the uh, vitamin D pathway. Okay, so it's not interfering with the vitamin D pathway, writing that vitamin D pathway, because you have the rescue of that phenotype. Okay, so um, we we perform a number of different pharmacological lineage tracing. And we also look at the VDR flux. So this is a cell type specific knockout for VDR to answer all of these questions. Hello, doctor. So yeah, we can um, wrap it up in like five to 10 minutes and we can open up for Q&A. That would be great. Thank yeah. you. Okay. 
Uh, perfect. Yeah, so I'm going to go speed through the, uh, the, the research. So this is all the GDNF, okay? I'm going to pass through all this. this just read this paper if you have time. Um, it goes into the GDNF story, okay? So um, I'm going to wrap it up. With, this is all the, uh, maybe I get out of here. What's important is to, um, let me back go to the screen. What's important, I want you guys to get out of this, is, is the research. But I want you guys to get out of this is some of the guidance for students. Okay, so uh, let me start here. Um, this is very important because I want you guys to get something practical. Um, out of this. Okay, so remember I talked to you about my uh, career path. Okay, and what's important about your career, your careers, is to understand that it is okay to have um, sort of divergence from your sort of linear uh, trajectory. Okay, so this is that linear trajectory. You, you're great outstanding students, right? Undergrad students, all eight pluses. You know, then you go to a PhD, then you go to postdoc, then you go to academia. But this non-linear pathway, all these squiggles on the side, is actually very common. Um, and this is from my own experience and also from uh, you know, my communication with many of my peers about how they've gotten into academia. Um, it's very, very common. Uh, for example, in my case, I did a post back for three plus years. Um, and what I got out of that was important, important training. Okay, and then I went back and did the PhD, and that really um, made me very independent. And I remember my PhD father came to me after I graduated and he said, I was like the easiest student he's ever had because I had that training from UCSF. And the, the other point is, it doesn't matter, you know, along your trajectory, whether or not you're a PhD student and decide to go out of uh, academia and then you know take a you know a different kind of job you can always go back there are ways to go back and I'm the perfect example of that you know I've I've uh, I've um, <clears throat> you know I've had a couple gaps along the way as well um, but right now I'm in academia and I, as I said I'm content with that right now and the other things is about mentorship okay whatever you do please find a mentor Okay, whatever, just, you know, if you email, I know that, I know the traditional strategy is just to email the PIs and you probably don't get responses. Send another email, okay? Uh, send a third email, send a fourth email, okay? Chances are you'll get a response then. And having a mentor is very, very important, okay, in your career. Whether, I mean, if you just decide to pursue something in biomedical or life sciences, or something else. In general, mentorship is very, very important. And these are all the characteristics that are important for that dualism between your mentor and mentee, okay? Uh, just consider that. And then in my own experience, um, you know, these are some of the things that I've done in terms of grant writing workshops. As an undergraduate, uh, uh, actually more as a, as a graduate in my case, but it's, it doesn't hurt to start early, okay, as an undergraduate. Okay, so grant writing workshops, mentoring programs, and you could get them through FASEB or, in my case, I was in the bone field, so I sought out a lot of these uh, specific initiatives. Whatever field you have, there's going to be an equivalent. Okay, so grant writing workshops and mentoring programs, important. And then join societies, okay, or whatever field you're in, join a society. This is a, uh, this is very important because you get perks, you get all these awards, okay. Uh, and this is all geared towards the bone when I was in, uh, a graduate student. Uh, seek out these uh, awards and these societies, okay? Lots of perks. I actually flew me out here to Sun Valley and I had to give a talk, okay? So this is a, um, you get all these different perks and, they, and you meet people, okay? And then this will help guide your career. And the other thing is uh, importance of cascading mentorship, okay? And what this means is basically find a lab with a postdoc. Okay, um, this is very important because there's sort of a hierarchy in the lab. So the grad grad students are great, but they're in training. 
undergrad students are kind of floating about, okay? But the postdocs are kind of career oriented, okay? They're kind of the drivers of the, uh, of the lab, okay? And then you have the uh, guidance from the PI. So as an undergrad, or uh, your, your interactions with the, uh, depending on the uh, institution, depending on the lab, is very limited. So it's been shown here, um, sort of statistically, that in fact, if you go into a lab with a postdoc or a series of postdocs, the uh, chances are high that you're going to improve your uh, skill development. Okay, so try to find a lab with a, with a postdoc. It generates a nice hierarchical um, uh, culture. And then this is more for postdocs, but it can also apply to uh, undergraduate students. What's important is not to think of yourself as just the lab rat, okay? Meaning that uh, you want to develop on your professional careers, uh, professional development, for example. There's a number of things that I've listed here. Uh, don't think of yourselves as another pair of hands in, at any uh, stage of your career, okay? So you want to develop these core competencies, okay? The research skills. Don't emphasize just the research skills. Emphasize every single element uh, in order to become a professional. Okay? And you can read up on this on the, at the National Postdoc Association. And these are some things that we can kind of uh, talk about later. These are some kind of guidance that um, uh, I take in order to um, um, try to create, uh, ask the, answer the question, why, why would someone pursue a career in academic research in biological and life sciences? Those are some of the things that someone asked me that question, I would respond with these um, answers here. Uh, importantly, be part of a team, have like-minded colleagues. Um, you know, it's a learning environment. So these are the things that uh, drive me every day um, in order to uh, continue in my lab. So, um, and then let's do two more, two more slides, okay? So general rules in the lab. Be nice, okay? There was this uh, book that came out from uh, Robert Sutton. He's actually a, a Stanford grad, okay? He has the, this no, the no asshole rule, okay? <laughs> Basically, uh, be nice, okay? Uh, so there's, uh, unless you're a Michael Jordan or Donald Trump, no one is talented enough to be an asshole, okay? So be nice, be available, okay? Uh, always try to say yes to a certain degree because that provides opportunities and people want to work with you and work hard, the uh, three A's, availability, affability, and ability, okay? And last, last slide, I promise, is uh, I kind of think of my position as a uh, four-legged stool, okay? So remember, this is academia, biological life sciences, okay, or biomedical life sciences. So I have to fulfill a research uh, component of my my program, my existence here, okay? And that entails uh, innovation and discovery. The other part is education, okay? So I have to educate the uh, students, okay? And the other part is academic service. So I sit on a number of committees uh, throughout the university, different departments, and I have to uh, interact with the different academic uh, uh, institutions. The other one's community service, and that's what I'm doing here. You know, I hope I can, um, you know, be of some influence, you know, in terms of your careers. Um, so I, I, I have no um, hesitation when I um, was asked by, uh, you know, Nina uh, to um, um, give this uh, a seminar. So basically, I have to figure out how to balance research, teaching, and administration, leadership, and societal impact. So I think we'll keep it at that. Thank you so much. Um, right now, I'm opening the floor to like question and answer. If you have any questions, feel free to type it in the chat. I can verbalize it for Dr. Lisi, or you can raise your hand and then I'll call out on you to ask your questions. Thank you.
Um, do you have any advice for people who might be um, discouraged in pursuing a P or like um, research? Um, I guess I would have to know a little bit more about what what is what is the the student discouraged about. Um, it can be daunting at times. Um, you know, for, for me, it was it was that mentor that got me <clears throat> really interested in science. So, you know, when I was an uh, undergrad, I didn't really get that one-to-one -one, um, interaction. So, believe it or not, at Purdue University, where I did my undergrad, my biology courses, my first year biology courses, were done in almost like a stadium-like setting. So there was uh, two sessions. Each session was about 3,000 students. So, you know, I just felt, you know, I was taking a course, I was learning things. And then as I, as I advanced through the years, I, you know, took the upper level courses, but there wasn't really, um, you know, someone that was guiding me about, you know, should I, you know, pursue a career? Should I do a summer internship? I knew that was that was important, so I did apply to some places. But it's you know you need that extra kind of guidance uh, to tell you okay how to apply those uh, how to how to write those applications what are those key words or what are the structures for the application you know what you know I didn't have that whole review process I didn't have that one individual um, that's why I emphasize try to try to mentor get a mentorship. Um, I know some universities have uh, very, very uh, well-defined mentorship programs. At the University of Miami, we have these summer internship programs for uh, women and minorities, for example. And I try to take, um, uh, I've had, since I've been here, I've been here since 2018, I've taken uh, one student each summer uh, in that program. And I also uh, have uh, these requests from the local community colleges, like, like Miami Dade Community College. I had people uh, reach out to me and say, you know, they don't have much resources over there. Can they do a, uh, you know, work during the summer? And uh, believe it or not, every year I say to myself, I'm going to take this summer off, but I end up, you know, in the lab with these students. So um, what's important is is to find that 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 person that's willing to kind of show you the way. It's, it's easier than said, than done, but um, that's, what, that's what got to me. But it wasn't until I was, you know, working as a, as a uh, uh, part of the staff that I got to that level, right? I think my life would have been completely different if I was, you know, if I had that kind of interaction during a, an undergrad. Um, as I said, you know, when you get into a lab, if you don't, if you don't feel right in that lab, you know, um, then it's, it's not a good fit, right? So you have, it's up, to, I think it's, uh, has a lot to do with the PI to make the, uh, you know, the working environment, learning environment, things like that. So, um, but like I said, there, there are a lot of uh, other factors involved, but, um, yeah, in terms of, I don't know what discouragement, it's, it could be a number of things. It could be academics, for example. Maybe uh, the individual doesn't have the, uh, the, uh, the grades, uh, you know, to, to continue. Maybe, maybe that's discouraging that person. My advice is, you, you know, you, you have to uh, try it. You know, try, 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 uh, you know, either working in a lab, or try to, um, you know, get get, uh, get a mentorship. Um, you know, it, it really depends. Like every PI is different, right? Some people, some PIs have very high standards, um, and there's a screening process. You know, there, there's so many different factors involved. My 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 advice is you have to try it, but. Um, you know, having that mentor, that guide is very important. And maybe, maybe think start start locally um, within your own universities um, and see whether or not they have these programs. 
I know the one that they have here is very, com very competitive, um, but they do a pretty good job, um, you know, in terms of uh, placing placement of these students. Um, so there's there's enough uh, positions openings every year. And remember, this is like pre-COVID, right? So we got a factor and all that. So um, yeah, so everything was kind of sh uh, shut down um, this this cycle. Um, thank you for that, um, Jasmine Fasada. Can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Thank you. Oh, yes. Um, hi, I had a quick question on, um, I was just curious if there's similar human disease um, facilities in the US, kind of like the one um, in Germany. Uh, I was just a little curious about that. Yeah, so um, the major uh, phenotyping centers in the world are in the UK. So there's uh, one, uh, it's MRC. So the that's the uh, it's kind of the, uh, the uh, same as the Germany, how they set it up. So what happened was in the early 2000s, um, all these uh, directors, so one of them being my PhD advisor, they got together and they decided in Europe to develop these mouse uh, phenotyping centers. And those uh, directors, one of them is uh, Steve Brown, he's, he's, in the, uh, he's in the UK, so he's in charge of MRC they decided to uh, put in tons of resources. And I don't know if you guys know about Germany, but it's broken down into 16 different states. And then each of these states has a different education ministry, um, finances and so forth. And so what in Bavaria, where, German, where Munich is, is one of the most, uh, it's the most uh, uh, rich um, um, uh, states in, in all of Germany. So they had tons of money to put into this. And when I started, they, they, I, we were also getting money from the, uh, the, the ministries. And then, and then they wanted to really compete with the US. So in the US, the biggest uh, mouse uh, center is the Jackson lab, okay, the Jackson laboratory. Um, that was the, that's the one where I was uh, before coming to Miami. And what's interesting is my PhD advisor in Germany did his postdoc at the Jackson Laboratory. So the Jackson Laboratory is really unique because it's kind of an academic center, plus it has a commercial uh, enterprise element to it. Okay, so it's, it's a, there's a private um, uh, enterprise component to it. But anyways, my, my PI or my advisor, PhD advisor, did his postdoc at the Jackson Lab. Then he went back to Germany and he got a lot of funding from the Ministry of, of Bavaria to start up a similar program that he learned from the Jackson Laboratory. Okay, so so they've uh, since early 2000, they've skyrocketed. Okay, into becoming one of the uh, major animal phenotyping uh, centers in the world. And what was interesting was when I was there, um, because in in, in uh, at UCSF when I was a, a postdoc or a staff research associate, there was this uh, mouse line or this uh, hamster line that they were working on uh, with a mutation or a loss knockout of the prion pr protein, the PRPC. And back then there was uh, this idea that PR they didn't know what the function of PRPC was. So because the knockout animals don't, they didn't have any cognitive issues or any uh, defects. So what I did was I, I actually proposed to my uh, my advisor, I said, let's, let's screen that animal, that line, using the German uh, uh, methodology, right? So all those different modules. I didn't show this, but the German mouse clinic has about 30 different physiological modules, okay? So looking at molecular, looking at heart, looking at cardiopulmonary changes, looking at uh, skeletal changes, looking at hormones, uh, steroid metabolism. Everything, environmental effects, you know, response to exercise, response to uh, heat changes. Okay, so we had stuck that animal, that line, very method, uh, strategically, and we actually picked up a lot of phenotypes. And the interesting thing is, we never published that. 
So um, yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of the uh, the power of that that whole system, and um, it's a uh, you know they're they're still doing good. They've they've gotten a number of really good publications out of that. Um, but uh, yeah, the equivalent here in the U.S. is the uh, Jackson Laboratory. Thank you for sharing. Um, so it looks like no one has any questions. So for the final part, do you have any last minute advice for anyone right now? Um, yeah, so maybe um, my advice here is um, this last slide here. So maybe persistence. So these are the key things that you have to consider in order to succeed. Um, idea. So that's basically innovation. Effort. So that's the persistence. And then teamwork, collaboration. Okay. So right now, I mean, we're for example, you guys setting up this uh, teleconference, okay, this Zoom meeting, you had to incorporate a lot of these elements, okay? And I am so impressed with what you guys did, okay? You guys formed a group, a team, okay? And then you uh, um, had a goal of uh, doing this peer shadowing uh, exchange, okay? This same concept applies to every element of your life, okay? You know, they say that genius is 1% inspiration. So you can have all the ideas you want, all the uh, uh, concepts, but you actually have to put something into it, right? Perspiration is 99%. So you have to actually engage and do something about it. And I think that's, I mean, it's, it's a good reflection of what, what you guys are doing, you know, with setting up this whole uh, peer shadowing program. So that's kind of the take home message, I would say. Okay, I will end the shadowing session here. Thank you so much for supporting us in our first ever week of shadowing sessions. And just thank you so much again. Thank you. No problem.